May we never forget that as a church, we serve the King of Kings, the one who conquered the grave, uh, reverse decay, rose triumphantly, and uh, his name is Jesus. I hope you know him. I know many of you do. Uh, and even today, as you listen, uh, may you renew your faith once again to walk closely with Jesus, uh, who is the King forever. You're turning to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel 6, uh, today is the final uh, sermon of the first half of Daniel. Daniel is unique because the first half is story-based, that is historical, covering the narrative of living in Babylon. And the next half of Daniel, 7 through 12, is more revelatory, revelation-oriented, future-oriented. Uh, so Daniel chapter 6, today we uh, round out this uh, great series uh, in the first half of the book of Daniel called Living in Babylon. Uh, my intent, church, has been to equip the body of Christ uh, dating back to a year ago when we started the book of First Peter. My intent from the book of First Peter and the book of Daniel as I assess culture and assess where the church is at is to equip the church to stand firm in Babylon. That's why Peter wrote to exiles in the book of First Peter and he ends that book by saying, she who is at Babylon sends you greetings. And after First Peter, that's what turned us to the book of Daniel, which demonstrates and it showcases us, uh, showcases for us what it looks like to stand firm in Babylon as Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, stood firm in character and consistency in the midst of a very dark culture. We begin the sermon by quoting Proverbs chapter 28. Love this proverb. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous are bold as a lion. That verse you could stamp right on top of Daniel chapter 6. In fact, that verse uh, pretty much summarizes Daniel's life. He was bold as a lion, wasn't he, in Babylon? Conformity could not ensnare him. A coercion could not bend him. Uh, it, all of the temptations of the culture could not trip him. This was a man who stood firm in character from his teenage years all the way now to Daniel 6, which is his elderly years. Some would suggest even a, around the age of 80. This man for seven decades lived bold as a lion in Babylon. In fact, speaking of lions... Daniel chapter 6 is all about that. It's all about lions. But I would contest to you that the real lion in this passage is Daniel himself. He is the lion. He is the one who's bold as a lion. Daniel chapter 6 is called Daniel and the lion's den, famously so. Uh, more so, more appropriately, I think we could call it the lion's tomb because that is indeed what it was. It was a tomb in which there were lions that existed and a stone would be rolled over top of it. And I would contest to you, as I mentioned and hinted at last week, that Daniel chapter 6 is to the Old Testament what the resurrection is to the New Testament. All through Daniel 6 is resurrection language, and, and there's hints and echoes of what would uh, come to be fulfilled in a true and better way. Uh, Jesus Christ being the true and better Daniel, being the true and better lion, being the true and better victor, the one triumphant over the tomb. There's so many parallels that as New Testament believers who follow that guy, Jesus Christ, <laughs> It is impossible to ignore. Here is the entire narrative uh, flowing through Daniel chapter 6. We have a conspiracy plotted by political leaders who conspire to arrest an innocent man. We have guilt declared, though the man was innocent and though nothing wrong could be found in him, there was no guilt or wrong of any kind. An execution is ordered. As the top political leader, in essence, washes his hands, he could do nothing, though there was no guilt found in the man. He washes his hands and orders the execution. He is thrown into a tomb, and the tomb is sealed by a stone, and the enemies rejoice because they know that they will wake up in the morning without the Jew in their way. But then, surprise ending. Here we go. The other, the next half of the story is this, the morning dawned. The scripture will say, at the break of day, 
I mean, the morning dawns, the night has faded, the sun has risen, and a man runs to the tomb to find what he will discover. The stone is rolled away as the man cries out into the tomb after the Jewish man who had been thrown in, and all of a sudden we find that death was defeated, and a hero is exalted, and the people of God are liberated. Does this story sound familiar to you? Daniel 6 runs on a parallel track with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It hints at it. There's echoes of it all throughout. So today, as a New Testament church who follows Jesus Christ, the living king, how many ears have you been given? There, it's not a trick question. Thank you. Two. And the reason why God gave you two ears is for today. Because you need to hear this sermon from two different ears. And the one ear, you need to hear the sermon from the lens of Daniel and seeing what it looks like to live as bold as a lion in Babylon. We need to see Daniel, yes, as, a, as an example, as a model of what it looks like to stand firm in Babylon and to walk in such a way that is consistent and with courage in the midst of a coercive environment. We need to hear it through that ear. But we also need to hear it through the ear of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That this story points us very clearly to the day that the tomb was defeated, the stone was rolled away, and the Jew emerged victorious, and the true Jewish hero is exalted, and the people of God are liberated, and God gets worldwide glory. Man, that's, the, that's Daniel 6. We should just pray and go home. Because that's an awesome story. But if, if, you, if you want to leave, you can. But now we're actually going to preach, okay? And so I've changed the whole outline as of 5 o'clock this morning. So if you're taking notes on your bulletin today, great. Uh, but, but this morning I kind of twisted the whole thing and, and just kind of turned it on its head a little bit. And so you can cross out the outline and put in this one. Here it is. A Jewish hero is executed. Phase one of the story, phase one, leads us from the arrest to the conviction to the execution. Phase one leads us uh, from the moment that Daniel is arrested in Babylon to the moment that he is thrown into the tomb and the enemies of God rejoice. The flow of the passage will be this. You're going to see Daniel's bold response. We're going to pick up the story where we left off last week. We're going to see Daniel's bold and courageous response. We're going to see the nuclear reaction of the enemies of God who find him and they entrap him. We're going to see a failed rescue attempt by the king himself, and we're going to see the deadly result as the king orders the execution of the man of God in Persia. We pick up in verse 10 where we left off last week, and we see the courageous and the bold response of Daniel. Here is the response. When Daniel heard that the law had been signed, the bill had been ordered, out, or out, um, uh, outlawing, there you go, outlawing prayer, here is his bold response. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. This is going to be a synopsis, two minutes of last Sunday. Darius, the king of Persia, had intended to elevate Daniel. He was nominated to the top political position in the entire empire. Daniel, being the nominee, was a Jewish man. And he would be overseeing 120 Persian political congressmen. And these 120 Persians were furious at the nomination. The reason they're furious is not just for political differences. It's for racial and religious reasons. Daniel is a Jew, and Jews have been hated throughout all of history, haven't they? It's also very religious. He was a man of faith. And so these 120 political congressmen uh, decide that they're going to find dirt uh, on Daniel, and they go through the seven decades looking for any dirt to, uh, to destroy his nomination or to block his nomination, but they can find nothing. Verse 5 says why. They could find no guilt of any kind, nor was there any fault in him, because Daniel was faithful. Is that a great verse, church, or what? He was faithful. Summarizes his seven decades in Babylon and now in Persia. Daniel was a man of faith. 
And so because they couldn't find personal dirt, they go after him with a law. They pass a law, uh, the political congressmen do, they pass a law that outlaws prayer. And it was intended as stop it, Daniel. And here was that summary from last week. Uh, the, the summary of the stop was there was a sanction. The bill was law- passed and it was signed into law by Darius. The time frame was a 30-day time frame. And what did the time frame outlaw? Here was the ordinance. You can't pray. You can't pray to any god except to Darius for 30 days. It was a law that went right to the core of their faith practice. And you have the penalty for noncompliance was death. That was the law. And in verse 10, we see the bold and the courageous response. When Daniel heard of that, it says he went to his house, hid the long walk home, and the whole time I'm sure he's processing what to do. Because as a citizen of earth, he was a law-abiding citizen. But as a citizen of heaven, He understood that there were things that he needed to obey and honor God. Church, I would encourage you with this. There are things now, but there were things yet to come in our culture where we will need massive amounts of two things, discernment and courage, okay? This is what I'm praying for, discernment and courage. I think what Daniel is going through on that long walk home is what believers in America are faced with today but will be faced with significantly in the future, and that is that combination of discernment and courage. Discernment to know, is this a law that goes right to the heart of my core faith practices, or is it just something I disagree with? Does that make sense, church? It's the discernment to know if a law goes to the heart of a core faith practice, and then it's the courage to respond in a way that is obedient to God, even if it suffers the consequences of earth. New Hope, I am praying for that dose of discernment and courage. And this is what we see in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. We see that Daniel responds with discernment and courage, by maintaining his core faith practices even in the face of an injunction. Well, this infuriates uh, the political leaders. Here it is. We see the nuclear reaction in verse 11, 12, and 13. But drawing attention to verse 12, it says this, Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel. Where is Daniel? Respond. He's praying. Where is he at, though? He's at home. Never underestimate the lengths to which the wicked will go to catch the godly. They found Daniel. And what is he doing? Making petition and plea before his God. Oh, church, there was people in Persia doing far worse crimes than Daniel. What is Daniel doing? He's committing the crime of prayer before his God, but they found him. It was entrapment. They conspired together. They plotted together. They had the law on their side, the injunction by their leader, and now they had the noncompliance. And using these two things now as leverage, uh, they, they bring together the law, the injunction, and Daniel's noncompliance, and they bring the matter before the king in verse 12. They tattle on Daniel. They say, hey, king, we found him. We found Daniel, this Jew, this nominee to the political appointment, and he's breaking the law, verse 13. Verse 13 says this, the nuclear reaction. They said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah. That's a, probably a little bit of a slam right there. A little bit of a racial bias. And Daniel, the Jew, pays no attention to you, O king or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. By the way, church, this already came up once in Daniel. Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When the whole culture was ordered to bow before the idol, they stood firm. They stood firm in their convictions. They didn't compromise. And the men in that day reported the matter to Nebuchadnezzar, and they said the same thing in chapter 3, verse 15, I believe it is, when they say, O king, these three men pay no attention to you. Which, by the way, is a false, uh, it's a false accusation. Of course, Daniel paid attention to the king. And as we're going to see later, Daniel even testifies that he's done no wrong to the king. He's done no wrong to his God. But he simply is, uh, is met with a, uh, an obstacle in his way. He cannot, in this case, 
obey both God and man, and so he chooses to obey the higher authority. I hope this makes sense, church. But the people, the enemies of God, go nuclear on him, and they uh, now have this leverage. They have the leverage both of Daniel's noncompliance and the law, and they report the matter to the king. And all of it, by the way, don't forget the motive, is to block the political nomination of Daniel. They want the Jew out of their way. Well, then we have a failed rescue. We have a failed rescue in verse 14. The king, Darius, this is his political nominee, and we don't know much about the relationship between Darius and Daniel. It was rather new. We know that. They haven't known each other for a significant length of time, but we do know that Darius respected Daniel enough to nominate him to the highest position, and so he attempts to rescue him. It says this, then the king when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. All the while, Darius, the king, certainly found Daniel to be innocent of any wrongdoing. I mean, this was was something that was, uh, I mean, was there worse criminals in Persia of murder, of thievery, of treason? Yes, there were. What, what is Daniel guilty of? He's guilty of prayer before his God. And so he set his mind to deliver him because Daniel in his mind is an innocent man. He's done nothing wrong. He's innocent. He's done nothing wrong. He's innocent. He's done nothing wrong. I find no guilt in him. Whoa, echoes, echoes of the cross, isn't it? John chapter 19, John chapter 20. Pilate says of Jesus three times, I find no guilt in him. And in John chapter 20, Pilate says very clearly, or it says in the scripture very clearly that that from that point on, Pilate sought to release him. Isn't that fascinating? But let's have just a little bit of a Christian empathy for Darius and for Pilate for a moment. We often don't hold up Darius and Pilate uh, as any examples to be followed, but let me tell you, let's have a little bit of empathy because of what they're facing. Uh, They have a political quagmire going on. Uh, They have all of their political leaders are against them. Their power base is at stake all over one Jewish man. And so all day long, both Pilate and Darius are faced with the same type of uh, crucible. They, they, have, they, they, have a, they have a critical decision to make in which do they side with the Jewish hero at the risk of their political power base or do they give in to what the political leaders are asking? And that is exactly what happens in the case of Pilate with Jesus and it's exactly what happens in the case with Darius and Daniel. It was a failed rescue attempt. He labored all day long, but finally the time came and the execution order is given, and it was a deadly result. Deadly result, verse 16. Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions, and a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. America has lethal injection. Babylon had fires. Persia has lions. It's the death penalty. This is how the culture dealt with criminals of the highest extreme. In Persia, it was lions. Uh, Lions are, we know them as apex predators. I love the term, apex predators. Apex meaning what? The top. It means they have no natural predators in in the wild. They are at the very top of the food chain. These are apex predators. In the den in which it is referred to is literally a tomb. It is a, it is a dark room in which lions are there, in which the apex of predators are, and it is a one-way destination. Anybody who goes in 
does not come out. That's just how the law works, right? When you go into the apex predators, uh, into, the, into the lair, into the den, into the tomb, it is a place that you do not come out. It is a deadly result. When verse 16 and 17 says that Daniel was cast into the den of lions, take a look at your Bibles. That should be the final verse in this chapter, shouldn't it? Church, It should be the final verse because it is a one-way destination. The apex predators ought to have their way. They always have their way. When somebody goes into the tomb, when somebody goes into the den, they are consumed, end of story, and end of chapter. It's at this point that Daniel is thrown into the tomb and the stone is rolled away and the tomb is sealed. It's at this point that the enemies of God have won. The man of God, the Jew, has been delivered over to death. The apex predator called death will have its way. But all the while, the man of God is entrusting himself to the one who has the power over death and hell. It is a bold and courageous response to the coercive attempts of governing leaders to attack the core values and the core practices of his faith. All the while, this man of God, the Jewish hero, is maintaining his courage in the midst of Babylon. And I love it that the chapter doesn't end there. Action step number one. Action step, days are coming, new hope, where we will need to be bold as lions. When will we need to be bold as lions? Here are some examples. When faith is forbidden, when family forsakes, when friends flee, and if I could add another one, when the feds file. We are not there yet, but in many cases we are, in which it is taking increasing courage to live for Jesus in Babylon. No, it is not the same level as Afghanistan today or as Iran or some cultures around the world in which extreme persecution is taking place. But church, I am once again calling you, I'm calling the church to be prepared to face difficult days in Babylon. That is my role. That is my, my role as the shepherd of this church is to take a look at the culture, to take a look at the church, and to take a look at what the scripture says, and then to proclaim God's word in such a way that makes sense and prepares and equips the body. So church, I want to tell you there's coming days in which we will have to be bold as lions in Babylon. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 1 says it again, the wicked flees when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as lions. I wish we had a record of what Daniel said as he was going towards the tomb. But interestingly enough, as I was reflecting even this morning, there is not a record of what he said. And even that echoes towards the cross. When Jesus Christ himself was on his way towards being crucified or when he stood on trial before Pilate, he opened not his mouth. In chapter 6 of Daniel, verse 17, says that Daniel was cast into the den of lions, the apex of predators, and death would have its way, and the tomb was sealed, and nightfall came, and darkness was over, and the Jewish hero was executed. That ought to be the end of the chapter, and that ought to be the end of the sermon, and we ought to go home. But wait! Don't you love that infomercial? But wait! Here it is, here it is. Here you go. But wait, the tomb was opened. The tomb was opened. We pick up the story. We pick up the story in the morning. The king has not slept all night. The king has been much distressed, and we find him in the morning running to the tomb. Here it is in verse 19. Verse 19, then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. Stop for a moment. Why in the world was he going to the tomb? 
What did he possibly think he would find? I mean, just stop for a moment. This is where you engage with the scripture. I mean, come on. We know that the apex predators are in there. We know they're hungry. And we know that Daniel has been cast in where many men and women had, had gone before. And we know the destination is death. And we know there's no hope. Why in the world would Darius possibly have raced towards the tomb? What did he expect to find? And we get just a hint of what his relationship with Daniel must have been like in this next statement. Darius says in verse 20, as he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? What did he expect to find? What we can gather is that Darius had such a relationship with Daniel that Daniel, even in his elderly years, must have left such an impact of faith and courage, uh, of hope in a living God. There must have been some sort of interchange between Darius and Daniel in which Daniel affirmed his faith was in the living God. Do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They said, O king, we cannot bow to your order. Uh, Let it be known to you, O king, that our God is able to deliver us from the fire, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow. Do you remember that, chapter 3? There must have been some sort of interchange between Darius and Daniel in which Daniel responded to this crime, to the injunction to say, Oh, Darius, O king, I can't abide by the injunction. And if you throw me into the den of lions, I want you to know that my God is able to deliver me. But even if he doesn't, let it be known that I serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Because it's at this moment that Darius cries out, oh, Daniel, has your God been able to deliver? I just just stop for a moment. I just marvel. I marvel at how much of an impact Daniel had in his elderly years. In his elderly, I mean, here he is, an aged man, even by our scope of the imagination. Here is a man who is, who is up in years and he's, he's leaving a legacy. He's passing a legacy. He's, he's, he's making a difference. He's influencing the world around him. He's speaking with courage. He's living with boldness and And he's not wasting his elderly years. Now, let me speak a word of encouragement and exhortation uh, to those of you who are in your elderly years. And far be it for me for putting an age on anybody's elderly years. So I'll just let you determine whether you are fit for this exhortation or not. Uh, But let me, well, okay, let me be a little courageous. If you're over 60, just listen. (laughs) Listen. Okay, fine, if you're over 55. But, But... Here's an exhortation. You can have such a huge impact in your elderly years. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. I mean, don't waste your upper 50s, your 60s, your 70s. By all means, don't waste your 80s. Don't wa- I mean, don't waste it. Leave a legacy. This is what Daniel's doing. In his elderly years, he's living with courage. In Babylon, he doesn't falter towards the end line. Leave a legacy, church. Here it is. I just want to encourage you to leave this legacy. Leave it all on the field. Don't hold back. I mean, come on, church. I mean, if you're, if you're statistically on that one-inch line or if you're in the last quarter of life, if you're in the overtime of life, leave it all on the field. I mean, what do you have to waste? Leave it all on the field for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Also, endure trials with confidence. We see that in Daniel as a teenager in his 20s and his 30s and now in his 70s, possibly in his 80s, that he's enduring trials with confidence in the living God because he has the power over life and death. Hold on to that. Cling to that. Give verbal blessings. I mean, don't waste that opportunities with kids and grandkids. You have such a power within your ability in your elderly years. By the way, I would just encourage you, you can get away with saying things in your elderly years that you couldn't get away with 20 years ago. Use it. Give verbal blessings. Pass it along. Also, act with character and consistency. 
Recognize the power of, of finishing your days with character as Daniel did. Also, consider the cost of missed opportunities. Consider the cost of what will take place possibly in the next generation if you don't leave that legacy. And finally, you in your elderly years yield each day to a faithful creator. For all of us, isn't it true that this day could in fact be our last? And now I speak to all of us, no matter what age, we recognize that today could be our last. And so we yield each day to a faithful creator. Whatever Darius thought he would find at the tomb, we don't know, but we do know that he was deeply impacted by this man of faith. And so the stone is rolled away, and he peers into the darkness of this lair of lions where the apex predators are. O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, been able to deliver you from the mouth of the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, <laughs> and I just, I don't want to rush past that phrase because that verse is impossible unless there's a living God who's over the lions. There's no way possible this verse should be in the Bible except we serve the living God who endures forever and his dominion will never come to an end. This verse ought not to be there except for the fact that we serve the God who is over life and death and tomb and death. He is the one over apex predators and he's the one over death itself, which is also the apex of all apex predators. Death itself. Daniel said, <laughs> from the darkness, from the tomb, from the lions, Daniel said, here it is, Verse 21, then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den Verse 23 ends this way, so Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him. Read it, church, with me. Because he had trusted in his God. This is resurrection language. This is resurrection language. This idea of being taken up, taken up, taken up out, out of the death. Out, listen, uh, this happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The three men were thrown into the fire. And after spending about an hour or so in the Babylonian crematorium, they emerged without any uh, spot or, or blemish to their garments. Not even the smell of smoke was on them. How is that possible? Well, we know it's possible because of what Nebuchadnezzar saw. He said, didn't we throw three people in there? Yes, King, we threw three. Well, how come there's four and one is like the son of God. It happens now with Daniel. Daniel is thrown into the, uh, the Persian death chamber. He spends an entire evening in an underground animal shelter, surrounded by lions, his new favorite furry friends. And it happens in this moment that Daniel now in the morning emerges. He's taken up out of the tomb how is that possible? Well, because there's another in the tomb with him. My God sent his angel to shut the mouths of lions. That's how it happens, and it happens with Jesus Christ. Christ thrown into the grave, uh, tomb sealed with a stone, only three days later to emerge victorious from the grave. How is that possible? How is it possible that Christ himself defeated death? Well, here is why it's possible. Acts chapter 2, New Testament. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Praise Jesus for that verse. It's impossible 
And the key of this passage, back to Daniel chapter 6, the key of the passage is that Daniel, it says in verse 23, the phrase, here's the phrase, that Daniel was taken up out of the tomb, out of the den, and no harm was found on him. Verse 23, it says in your Bible, because he had trusted in his God. That's the key. The key of the passage, in fact, I would say, church, the key of life is that from womb to tomb that we are folks who trust in the living God. We are those who trust and affirm that he is the God over the fires, he is the God over the lions, he is the God over the grave. He is the one who rules over death, he shuts the mouths of lions, he is the king of Judah, the lion he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and so he, he is the one in whom we trust. And so we stand with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we say, our God is able to deliver from the flames. We stand with Daniel, who must have told Darius, our God is able to deliver from the lions. And we stand with Jesus Christ as we look towards the future and death itself, and we stand with confidence because we are people. We are people who trust in the living God of the resurrection hope. We are people who trust. Here it is, trusted. Uh, we're going to go through trust God with daily details from womb to tomb. New Hope, action step number two, trust God with daily details from womb to tomb. All through life, we have things that weigh heavy on our shoulders. They, uh, they, they burden us down. They cause us to grow anxious in spirit. We have fearful trepidation, health concerns. We have child concerns. We have grandchildren concerns. The things that weigh heavy upon us, the trials and the difficulties and the political instability around the world, so many things weigh heavy. And yet through it all, here is the action. We are a people who trust God with every detail of life, and we do it from womb to tomb, knowing that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. How to do that practically? Here's some things practically. Uh, because we are people who trust God will. This is what we are. As a Christian people who believes in the resurrection hope, we are people who believes God will manage our trials. He will manage them. He will manage the timing of them, the purpose of them, and the outcome of them. That's who we are. And so when we face trials, we are people like Daniel who trust in our God. We are people who believe that God will uphold his word, will he not? In every circumstance, he will be faithful to his promises. He will vindicate his church. He will act on, a, on behalf of his people to protect, to defend, and cause his church to be victorious. What did Jesus say? I will build my church. And even, what? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's a promise. He will vindicate his church. He will judge his enemies. As we see in verse 24, when the enemies of Daniel are dealt with in, his, in, in all of their families. But we have a God who will judge his enemies. And we trust that he will do that in his time. He will raise the dead. The, de the destination of hell being, the, being a one-way destination, as, as we think of it, will not be the one-way destination because Christ himself, who has been raised, will also raise his church. We also believe that God will rule the nations. This is the theme that emerges in Daniel from both Nebuchadnezzar's lips and in a moment from the lips of Darius. We serve the king of kings who rules the nations, the lion of Judah, the lamb that was slain, and he currently is exalted to the right hand of the Father where he rules over all with great authority and power, and he will have the ultimate supremacy, and we serve a God who will endure forever. He gets the glory forever, and one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Daniel chapter 6. We have a Jewish hero executed, but wait, the tomb was opened. And we end with this great exaltation, here it is. But the tomb was opened, and God gets worldwide glory. Darius issues a proclamation after what he just witnessed. I mean, after... This is a resurrection story, okay? This is the impossible has happened. The tomb has been opened. 
And the one who has been given over to death has now emerged and been taken out and lifted out victorious and triumphant. And this was a moment of proclamation where God himself gets worldwide glory. Here is the proclamation. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all of my royal dominion, people are to tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lion. The king of Persia gives a State of the Union address, and in the State of the Union, he issues the proclamation that there is one God, the living God, who is over the power of the lions. He has the power to deliver. He has the power to rescue. He commands all people everywhere to fall on their knees and worship at the feet of this one whom Daniel serves. It is this story that catapults Israel into a new season of liberation and freedom. They come out of bondage as a result of what happened here at this story. We get the books of Nehemiah and Ezra and the books of rebuilding the walls and the Jewish exiles going home. And isn't that our ultimate hope of the Christian church? That Jesus Christ, the one who defeated the tomb, came out victorious, defeated death, reversed decay, rises triumphantly, is exalted to the right hand of the Father. Isn't it true that the ultimate hope is that the one day that our living Savior will be worshiped and get worldwide glory forever and ever, and his dominion will never come to an end. That's the hope of the church. As our worship team comes, church, a few final exhortations. Where have we been today? Well, let me just cover briefly. Here we go. I believe a day is coming in which it will take great courage to live in Babylon Dark days will require great courage. It will require discernment and courage, discernment to know when faith practices are being attacked and courage to respond the way that God has called us to. We are called to leave a legacy. No matter what age we are, but especially the elderly, leave a legacy. Leave it all on the field. Give it all for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And no matter what you're facing in life, May it be said of us that you are those who trust in your God. You are those who trust that God has the power to deliver and rescue. We point all the emphasis and all the attention to him. He gets the glory. He gets the credit until the final day that he who is the way, the truth, and the life receives the praise around this world for his glory. Let's pray. Thank you today, Father that you still have the power to deliver and rescue. Thank you for Christ our Lord, the one who defeated death and on that morning at break of day when those people ran to the tomb, they found it empty. Empty because Christ had conquered the apex predator. May we live with courage in Babylon. Thank you, Lord, for the word today as it has encouraged us. May we now live it out for the sake of Jesus, our Lord. Well, to those of you in our digital New Hope family, thank you. Uh, thank you for your faithful prayers, participation, and partnership in the gospel ministry here at New Hope. Greetings to you all. Hundreds of families who gather every single week in our online family. You are dearly loved. Well, our youth center is officially open. Uh, be in prayer for us and be in prayer for our teenagers as we train up Daniels and Esthers to be bold as lions in Babylon. And that is my prayer for you, New Hope, as you leave today. Uh, my prayer comes from Proverbs chapter 28, that as the days get darker, that God would enable you to stand firm in faith and be bold as lions. Until next Sunday, I'm Craig Truather, your pastor praying for discernment and courage as you live for Jesus in modern-day Babylon. Remember, you are loved.